been renting for quite a while. Uh, perhaps you are already preparing to buy your first home and not sure what the next steps are, what you need to do, interest rates, lending, the buyer process. Today, we are going to cover it all. So thank you for being here. I'm Gia Silva. I'm the owner broker of Inti Realty here in Long Beach. We're off of Belmont Heights, just a few blocks from the beach. And it's, you know, I've been in real estate for about 20 years, 20 years, wow, it's a lot, <laughs> 20 to 21 years now. We've been here uh, in Belmont Heights for about five years now. And today we have, I'm super excited to be here with Carrie, who's gonna, our trusted Hi. financial advisor. We have Kathy, who is our first time buyer specialist, our buyer specialist. And so we are going to dive right in. A little bit about me, uh, aside from professionally, when I'm not with clients, when I'm not putting together these workshops or working with that, with sellers or homeowners, uh, I am looking for a new trail to find, to run. I'm a big trail runner uh, and also looking for new places to travel because I do a lot of solo traveling. So if you guys want to learn more about like the places I go to or trails, and if you're a runner, hit me up. So today we are going to talk about, in today's agenda, we're going to talk about who is your support team when you're getting to ready to buy a house, who are the partners that you absolutely need on your side to help you make this happen. We're also going to talk about understanding a budget. So what is it that you need to do in order to plan to buy your first home? We're going to talk about the buyer process. Hi, Gerardo, come on in. We're going to talk about the buyer process, and Kathy's really going to go into how buying a house is like dating. Interesting, huh? And also, lastly, we're going to talk about the point of view of the listing agent. When you are getting ready to buy your first home, there is also another party at the end of it, which is the listing agent who is representing the seller, right? So we're going to talk about who you are as a buyer in today's market, but also the point of view of the agent that's receiving your offer. So let's get right to it, you guys. Um, your support team is very important to have as you're planning to purchase your first home. You absolutely want to have your accountant. You absolutely want to have a financial advisor that you're speaking with, your mortgage lender, and also your real estate team. Okay, so what if you're like, well, gee, I don't, I don't have an accountant. I like, you know, I do my taxes in H&R Block. I don't, <laughs> right? I, some people do that and they don't have someone that they trust that they can actually call and say, you know, how do I do this? How do I file my taxes? What can I write off as a first time buyer? So these are the, the, the partners, the people in your support team that you absolutely need to have as you're preparing to buy your first home. And which one of these, you guys, do you believe that you need to be speaking to probably like initially when you're first creating that plan to buy a home? Anybody? Financial advisor. Oh, Carlos, you're right. Financial advisor, right? And many people actually don't have a relationship with, with a financial advisor. Um, and it may be because, oh gosh, they don't have no idea that it may be very costly, right? But to get started, having a conversation, having a consultation with a financial advisor to take you through understanding a budget and what you need to do is going to be super pivotal, pivotal to you purchasing your first house. So I'm going to introduce Carrie Schultz, right. who's our trusted financial advisor, and he's going to go right into understanding a budget. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. As she has said, my name is Carrie Schultz. A um, little bit about myself. I graduated from Cal State Long Beach with a degree in business administration, emphasis in accounting. And I've worked within the accounting and finance fields for over 12 years now. Um, I am a CFA charter holder, which means basically it's a fancy way of saying that I'm a qualified financial advisor that people can come to with their financial questions whether that's investment advice, retirement planning, or purchasing a piece of real estate. Um, when I'm not giving my clients excellent financial advice, I'm usually spending time with my husband, James, and our two dogs, Lady and Pogi. For those of you who don't know, Pogi means handsome in Tagalog, <laughs> and he knows it. 
Um, so with that, let's jump in. So when you're planning on purchasing a financial uh, first, your first time home, um, it's a really big investment and big decision that you're making. So it's more important than ever to be prepared. And where you start preparing, the first place you should start preparing is your budget. So <clears throat> show of hands, how many of you actually have a budget written down where you compare your expenses on a regular basis to that budget? <laughs> Honestly, that's pretty typical. Uh, most people don't operate with a budget. And that's fine if it works for you in your day to day. But when you're preparing to purchase your first home, having a budget in place really ensures that you're avoiding any negative consequences when you go for that home. <clears throat> so what is a budget? Well, a budget is kind of like a bank statement, right? It itemizes what's coming in, what's going on out. You can see transaction by transaction. Um, and it really gives you valuable insight into where you're spending your money, if you're spending too much money, and where you can make cuts to improve your um, overall financial health. So if you don't have a budget and you've never prepared one, where should you start? Well, we recommend that clients gather together the last three months of financial statements, your bank statements, your credit card statements, um, an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet, a spreadsheet will come in very handy here. But if you're just a pen and paper person, that's totally fine too. Once you have those statements, you're going to go through line by line, transaction by transaction, and you're going to group those expenses. Now, what do I mean by grouping? Well, if you have expenses at Trader Joe's, Vaughn's, and Ralph's, you're going to group those for that month and label it groceries. If you've got expenses where you're paying the city of Long Beach or whatever city that you're in, and maybe Southern California Edison, you'll group those together and you'll title them utilities. So you'll do this for all the transactions and keeping them separate in your three separate months. And then once you've done that, you're going to go through and categorize them. Now, I like to put them into four categories. You've got your fixed and necessary. These are expenses that aren't going to fluctuate much month to month, and they're necessary for you to live, right? That's going to include your rent, your car payment, your student loans, even though we've had a little deferral recently, those are coming back, so you need to factor that in. And then the next step is to go for your fixed and non-essential expenses. Those are going to be expenses that are fixed, but you don't really need them to live. Think Amazon Prime membership, your Netflix subscription, your gym membership, maybe. After we've grouped and categorized all those, then you'll go into your variable um, and necessary expenses. Now, these expenses do fluctuate slightly month to month, right? Think your grocery bill, your utility bill, things like that. And then the last one, the last category that you're going to go into is going to be your variable non-essential. These are going to be things that fluctuate a lot, maybe month to month. Think vacations, eating out, weekend getaways, maybe even birthday gifts, things like that. So once you've grouped and categorized all of these expenses, you're going to take that total expense and you're going to reduce your income by that expense to come up with your net income. So we've got a little example here on the handout. In this example, we've got a couple, they're bringing in $10,000 a month. They've grouped and categorized all their expenses, and then they've come down to their net monthly income. Now, if you were my client and you came to me and showed me a net monthly income of $5,600, I'd look at you and ask, is that what you saved last month? Nine times out of 10, the answer is no. Why? Most of the time, people forget those one-off expenses. Maybe you just paid to put your kid in summer camp. 
Maybe you just booked flight, a flight out to your next vacation. You forget that expense because it wasn't in the last three months. So what we need to do is we need to add a pro rata share to those three months, right? If you spent $12,000 on a vacation, congrats, that was a nice vacation. You still need to allocate a third of that to each of those three months that you just went through, right? As a placeholder, because that is an expense that's going to need to be paid for. Another example of some reason that that might not match up, sometimes clients forget a statement, right? Maybe you've got a credit card statement you opened up two months ago and you forgot to go through those transactions because you don't really use it that often, but you opened it and you did charge something to it. So go through and add those transactions, group them and categorize them so that your net income is accurate. Okay, so once you've nailed down that net income, you're going to add your rent to that figure. Why? You're looking for your first time home. Once you move into that home, you're not going to pay rent anymore. Okay, so going forward, that is going to give you your new home budget. Now, in our example, that's $7,800. It's important to realize this new home budget is for everything associated with your home. It includes your property taxes, your principal and interest, your insurance. If you have a homeowners association, it's gonna include those HOA dues. It includes repairs and maintenance. And if you buy something that you wanna do a little improvement on, it's gonna include that as well. It is your maximum spend without changing your lifestyle that you have to spend on a new home. So once we've nailed down that number and we realize that that's our maximum, we're not going to take that number to our real estate agent or our mortgage broker and say, hey, this is what I can spend on my mortgage alone, right? We need to make adjustments. How much of an adjustment you make is going to depend on what type of home you go for. If you're going for that fixer upper, you're going to need to make a bigger adjustment, right? Things come up, the unexpected happens. If you're going for the home that was just remodeled or the condo that was just remodeled and everything's brand new, well, maybe you can push it a little closer to the top of the line there. It's going to depend on what you find and what you go for, though. Now that we understand how to create a budget and what kind of home payment our cash flow can support, the next important step is to understand your debt-to-income ratios. These ratios are what your mortgage broker is going to use to qualify you for a mortgage, okay? So the first ratio is going to be your front-end ratio or your housing ratio. This ratio takes a look at what your home expenses are in relation to your gross income. So your gross income is going to be what you make before you pay for your taxes, your social security, your health insurance, your retirement plan, all those things, your gross income. So in our example, we've put down that this same couple, they brought in 10,000 a month, we grossed it up, they're making around 175 a year. Multiply that by the maximum front end ratio that most lenders will approve, which is 28%, and we have $49,000. You divide that by 12 and you get 4,083. This is the maximum home expense that a mortgage lender would approve you for. This home expense though includes your principal and interest, your insurance, your taxes, and any HOA dues, okay? It's important also to note that 28% is the norm. You may find a lender out there that's willing to push the envelope a little bit and go up to 31% for an FHA loan. It's going to depend on what kind of mortgage you're going for. Okay, so now that we have our maximum front end load, you'll notice that up above your new home budget is 7,800. Down below your front end load or your front end housing ratio is 4,083. What is your <laughs> 4,083? 
you will only qualify for a mortgage payment and housing expenses that are 4,083. So even though you have a budget of 7,800, that doesn't matter. You're gonna be maxed out at 4,083, which is a good thing in this scenario because we don't wanna go overboard and have to change our lifestyle. This will allow for more room for improvements, repairs and maintenance, et cetera. Now, once we figured out that front end ratio, the next step is to go to the back end ratio. Your back end ratio is your total debt ratio. It takes a look at what all of your debt payments are in comparison to your gross income. The maximum you can spend here is 50%. Now, it's important to note that on the 50%, that really only applies to those lender or those borrowers that have significant assets, um, good income, and high credit ratios or high credit scores, rather. If you don't fall into that category, then you're looking at a ratio as low as 36% for conventional and 43% for an FHA loan. So using the same income figures that we had before, 175, using that higher 50%, we come up with 87,500. We divide that by 12 and we're at 7,291. Now, that's great. What do we do with that figure? Well, the next step is you need to reduce that number by all of your debt payments that you currently have. So if you've got a car loan, subtract that. If you have student loans, subtract that. If you have a personal loan, a 401k loan, you need to subtract from this number until you get down to that net number, which let's say in our example, $5,000. That tells me that you can go up on the back end to that $5,000 figure. But remember, your front end is $4,000. So which ratio is going to determine what you qualify for? It's always going to be the lower of the two. Okay. Now, you'll want to understand your credit score when you go to your mortgage broker. So pull that figure. And when you go to your mortgage broker, he'll be able to advise you on whether you maybe should take some of that down payment that you've saved and apply it to the debt to where your back end ratio is less of a figure or what ratios would apply given your credit score, right? If it's going to be the 36 for the conventional or if we can push it to the 50, it's going to depend on what lender you're using, okay? So now that we understand how to create a budget, how that's going to determine what type of what home payment we can afford for our cash flow without changing our lifestyle, what the ratios are that will determine what type, uh, what loan will qualify for. The next step to understand is you need to account for the unknown. Okay, be realistic here. Buying a home most likely is going to lead you to a change in lifestyle where you need to prioritize need versus want, right? And also, you're no longer going to be able to call a landlord. If something breaks, that's on you. So have some money set aside after you put your down payment down so that you can afford to replace things and repair things so that you can take care of the emergencies as they come and not put yourself in a pickle. Okay. So I'm sure there are some people after going through all that, that think, well, I thought I was ready, but now I really don't know. I, I, I may need to hold off here or heck. I mean, you may be one of those people that are saying, well, this is a lot. I don't know if I'll ever be able to afford a home. I promise you, if you prepare, you will be able to afford a home. You just need to do it correctly, okay? So what can you do to prepare if you fall into this category? Well, really, there are five steps that you can take. The first, go back to your budget. We just went through that categorization and identified expenses that are non-essential, right? That's your first attacking point. If you have some expenses that you could remove that would allow you a larger home budget, 
so that you can maybe afford the home that you're looking for, then we should see what that would look like going forward. Okay. Now, we've, once you've gone through your expenses, the next piece, the second piece is to look at your income. Realize that incomes are rarely stagnant, right? People receive raises. What you do with that raise is going to determine what happens in your house hunt, right? If you change your lifestyle, nothing's going to change. If you instead opt to save that increased income, well, then that will allow you to do two things. One, increase your down payment, and two, increase your budget. Okay? The third step you're going to take is you're going to go talk to an accountant. Now, we mentioned this previously, but it's really important in this scenario. With interest rates around 7%, it's highly likely that you will receive a tax benefit from paying that interest, which will reduce the true cost of ownership. Okay, so go talk to your accountant and see if buying a home with that deduction would improve your tax, tax picture enough so that you could afford what you want. Your fourth step is to realize that there are such things as starter homes, right? Not everyone can afford to move into that million plus home right off the bat. Rarely is that possible, actually. So you're going to need to make some compromises. What compromises you need to make will depend on your budget and your ratios. But getting into a home, building that equity, and then using that equity to, equity to move into your next home is how many people have afforded to get into those million dollar homes in the first place. Realize that you're in this spot now, first time home buyer, and when you're ready to move, someone else will be where you're at now to purchase that home from you, okay? And lastly, that fifth step, set yourself up for success. You want to talk with your financial advisor, your accountant, your mortgage broker, your real estate team. These professionals should be working together to create a plan that will ensure your success. So now I hope that I helped you guys understand how to go through and create a budget, what that means and how to really look at those figures what those ratios are that are gonna determine what you can qualify for. Once you now that you have a firm grasp on all of that, your next step is to reach out to your real estate team, right? They're gonna be the ones that can take that budget and show you what's out there and what we need to get you into a new home. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Kathy, NT's buying specialist, Kathy. Thank you. Gary? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, thanks for joining today. My name is Kathy Tran. I've actually been a buyer specialist here with Inti for the past five years now. I uh, studied economics in my undergrad at UCLA. So when I'm not spending hours geeking out with buyers over market conditions and infographics, I'm probably rescuing senior dogs. Now, I'm sure you're a bit like me, where your motivation to purchase that first home is for your fur baby. Um, <laughs> I actually bought my first starter home in March 2020 when COVID hit. I know it sounds crazy in hindsight. And believe it or not, it was me and my dog. That was it. Um, I'm very fortunate enough this past March this year to now go into my second home with another person, right? So your motivation to purchase your first home, maybe you're sick of renting. You hate your landlord, not you, Jess, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> you know, you may be wanting to move into that next phase with your partner, right? Whatever your motivation is, that's going to vary, right? And that's why it's really important that you have clarity and work with someone that will help you through the process. And what I found is that most first-time buyers really have a, an understanding when I relate buying a home to dating, right? 
all of our journey is going to look a little bit different, but the overall process is going to stay the same, right? I'm sure you guys have all dated before. I mean, does anyone want to keep dating the rest of their lives? Does that sound fun? No, right? So ultimately, your goal, right, is to find a home to actually commit to, which is like the marriage part of it. But just like the dating process, you don't want to date every single person or marry every person that you date. I'm sure. Okay. So let's jump into this. Before we dissect the three different phases, I want to briefly introduce who's going to be pivotal in helping you get to this stage of like finding your first property. The first two people here um, are going to be very crucial and are helping you literally every step of the way. So your buyer's agent is your dating coach, right? Like your matchmaker. I'm going to be here and I'm going to hold your step, hold your hand every single step of the way. Your lender, and we actually do have a lender here, Sergio, he'll be able to answer any questions that you guys have right after. He is so crucial to this whole process, and we need his support from the very beginning all the way through the marriage as well, too. Now, the next four people, you see title, escrow, home inspector, and the appraiser. These people don't make an appearance until like the third phase of the dating process. But I do want to introduce them really quick because you're going to hear these terms get thrown around a lot. So escrow is like a neutral third party. You can think of them as like your therapist in that relationship or like a referee in a sports game, right? They're completely neutral and they don't come into play until you actually are in a relationship, in a binding relationship. Now, title does work silently in the background, but title is really important because they make sure at the very end of everything that your name pops up when you're Googling who owns this property now, right? So that's their job. The home inspector and the appraiser, these two, I want to differentiate. The home inspector determines condition. The appraiser determines value. Most first-time buyers get really confused and flip-flop the two, Okay. So the home inspector, I'm most likely on the first round of viewings with you guys will not be jumping on the roof, will not be crawling under the house, will not be um, testing the plumbing. So this is where we lean on the home inspector a little bit later in the process to do everything, right? And the appraiser is crucial because unless you're paying cash, you're very likely going to require an appraiser to come out to the property to give you the value of the home. All right, we're going to jump into the three phases of dating. So now the first part is meeting with your dating coach. Now, the first four tick marks that you see, the meeting, the budget, the pre-approval letter, and the buckling down of neighborhoods, these can fluctuate in the order, right? I've had buyers come to our first meeting already have spoken to a lender, right? Most first-time buyers come to me and don't know anything. And that's totally fine. Don't worry, right? This is where your dating coach is going to hold your hand through the entire process, right? We're going to discover a lot about your likes and dislikes. We're going to talk a lot about your deal breakers as well, right? Getting to know things you're flexible with so we can open your options when we're looking for your first property. Now, your budget is really important, guys, because we're always going to go back to a monthly tangible number. Just because your lender approved you for that million-dollar home doesn't mean you should buy the million-dollar home, right? We're always going to go back to your monthly budget. And don't worry, your dating coach will keep you accountable if you start going out of line over budget, okay? The pre-approval letter from your lender is very important. Now, I know all these fancy third-party sites have that fun little mortgage calculator. You can play around with that all day long. And those are great estimates to have. At the end of the day, it is not precise, right? Just like Carrie said, your lender is going to take a deep look at your debts, looking at your ratios, your FICO score to then determine what interest rate that you're getting. By the way, if you didn't know, the interest rates fluctuate every single day and they fluctuate also multiple times throughout the day, which is why it's so important that the lender signs off on that pre-approval letter to give you the green light 
to actually start dating. Okay. We do it right the first time around so that you don't get bombarded with all these emotions and don't really know where to begin. Okay. Now that completes the first phase of it. Um, lastly, talking about neighborhoods is really important, guys. You hear this all the time. When it comes to real estate, it's all about location, location right? Because we can knock down the walls of the house. We can paint it bright orange if your heart desires. I can't change the neighbors. I can't pick up the house and move it. So neighborhoods are going to be super important when we're discussing your parameters as well. All right. Fun stuff. Phase two. Phase two is now entering the dates. Okay. So first, we're all going to download those fun dating apps. I am not part of that right now, so I don't know what is out there. But something about like swiping left or right, you're going to have a big pile of like, I never want to see your face again. And you're going to have a small list of like, I want to see you in person, right? Now, how many of you have been catfished? <laughs> Raise of hands. Catfished. Okay. That's going to happen to you as well. It's inevitable. How many of you have gotten your heart broken? Everyone, I'm sure. And it's inevitable that this is also going to be a part of the process as well, right? Now, in the very beginning, after you've swiped, I think right is the direction for all the homes you do want to see, we're going to go on these first dates with the properties, whether that's us going together to an open house, perhaps you're venturing off on your own to the open house, or I'm scheduling these appointments for us to go together. We're speed dating, guys, because realistically, we're spending 15 to 20 minutes with these dates. And then you're going to have to go back and decide what you want to do next. Sounds kind of scary, right? So first, the first tick mark here, property rating. I am going to stay very objective in this journey because after the first round of dates, we're all going to be curious. How did your dates go? Right. On a scale of one to 10, what are you ranking each one? Right. At this point, because you guys have already agreed that you don't want to keep dating the rest of your lives, your time is valuable. So now this is where we get intentional. Right. Which one from the first round of dates do you want to see yourself going into a possible relationship with? That's the conversation that we're going to be having, right? Give me the rating of each property, right? If we saw, let me give you a, a hypothesis. If we saw five properties this, this upcoming weekend, we go on five dates. After the weekend, you're like, gosh, Kathy, I actually like three of them. I don't know what to do. Well, what do you think I'm going to encourage you to do in terms of writing offers? Put all three in. Exactly. You're going to be writing on all three. Why? Well, you're not telling each of the other sellers that you're dating other people, right? <laughs> it's a numbers game, guys. We're not committed yet. You don't need to commit to one person yet. You're not in a relationship yet. So, Date all you want, right? We're going to write as many offers as you want. Now, when we get to the offer strategy, right? We're going to do some stalking. We're going to go on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. We're going to find out everything about this person possible. Similar to the home buying process, right? We're going to look at comps, market conditions, seller motivations, right? We want to gather all the, as much data as we possibly can to then go to writing the offer, Okay. Writing the offer is similar to like you're putting yourself on a resume to these potential houses that you want to get into a relationship, right? You only have one shot of it. So you've got to put your best foot forward. We're going to talk about terms of the offer, right? Not only the price, like when do you want to move into the property, right? Do you want to keep the appliances? Like all those little things when it comes to writing the offer, now, remember, the goal is to get into a relationship, right? So we still want to be best foot forward as we're submitting each one. And we're not going to be writing offers on all of them. Based on the property ratings, the ones that are the highest are the ones that are worth your time, right? So in the package of the offer, it's not just the offer, guys. It's a whole thing we're selling, 
to the seller. We now need the lender's pre-approval, right? We may need to show how strong of a credit score you have. So we may need to submit proof of that. We also would need to send over proof of the statement of where your down payment is coming from, right? There may be some videos involved as well. All of this together tied with a nice little bow is then presented to each of the sellers, right? It's not just the offer. So pre-approval credit score videos, if we're lucky, we're going to get a counter. And really quick, a counter is just like some pre-negotiations that are happening before you enter the phase of going into a monogamous relationship. Okay. So let's say before we jump into phase three, let's say you had three people you liked, three houses you liked, you wrote three offers, all three want to take you as their partner. Like all three of them want to enter a monogamous relationship with you. Now, can you enter all three? No. You can't because now you are no longer dating. Okay. Now you're advancing to the monogamous relationship stage. So ideally we would love you to be in a position where everyone's lining up to date you and go into a relationship. But realistically, you can only choose one. And if that's the case, you pick the one that you like the best. And now we're going to roll into phase three of the dating process, which is the last phase. Now here, you're opening escrow. You're each changing your relationship status, but you're not fully committed yet, right? You can change your status without getting married. Okay. So status is now changed. You're not allowed to date other houses now, and the seller is also not allowed to date other buyers anymore at this stage. Okay. Now, just because you change your relationship status, you still have three important milestones to hit and conquer really with this potential partner before you decide to get married. So the first one, the physical inspections, right? This is the most important part. This is like you now have moved in with your significant other and all the skeletons come out of the closet, right? You get, you do all of your inspections, you review all the disclosures. If you're in a condo, you review all the CCNRs, right? Like literally all the skeletons should be out of the closet at this point. Now, inevitably, you're gonna have some differences, right? Your partner has some horrible habits that you were not anticipating now that you've lived with them, right? The question is, these differences that you're facing, can you overcome them together, right? Can you negotiate with each other to see what's the win-win scenario? We hope that you can make it through this first milestone. If not, well, guess what? If you come across a deal breaker with this house, this partner, and you're like, I cannot marry someone like this, guess what? You can break up with this house, go back to phase number two, and we are dating again. Fun stuff, right? Now, let's say you guys moved past your differences and uh, you guys are happy so far. We then shift to the second part, the second milestone, which is the appraisal. The appraisal, imagine you are meeting your in-laws. This is a pivotal part of your relationship as well, right? Chan there could be a chance you uncover even more differences at this point. The question is, can you overcome those differences or is this another deal breaker? Again, if it's a deal breaker, you could break up, break up, break up and we're going to go back to dating phase two again. OK, if everything works out, you've compromised on your differences. We move then to the final milestone, which is the loan, right? The loan part is similar to like, you're about to be engaged to the property, okay? Going that next step there, it means you're pretty committed from the loan all the way down to the close of escrow. You're kind of walking down the aisle at this point. Now, yeah, runaway bride, runaway groom, that could happen. You do put, you leave a little bit more on the table at this point if you do leave the relationship, but just know that you still can. 
Okay. And then when you get to the very, very end and you close escrow, you're officially married. Easy, right? Yeah, we can all buy a house now. We have all dated, right? Okay, so we went through three phases of where buying the house is like dating. Can we guess in which of the three phases where most buyers get either stuck or feel left in the dark? Can we take a guess? Phase one, two, or three? One. Jacob says one. Anyone else? Okay. So most buyers, believe it or not, get stuck in phase two. Okay. Phase two, on a very micro level, we as humans like to really focus on our wants, our needs, our desires. We also forget in this grand scheme that there's another person, another seller that's part of this equation, right? So we're so hyper-focused at times on the stuff we want that we totally disregard the other person in the relationship. Sound familiar? Okay. So it's very important that we understand the other side as well and how they're motivated to make certain decisions. So today we have Gia here. She is our listing specialist. She'll be able to give us some clarity on the other side. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Okay. So can we all agree that? Yes, it is like dating. Buying a house. It is like dating, right? That was wonderful. I mean, what a like clear explanation about (laughs) purchasing a home. And as a listing agent, you guys, um, there's different hats I wear. Sometimes I'll wear a hat of a buyer's agent. Kathy's our buyer specialist. But most of the time, I find myself representing sellers. Okay. So I want to give you the point of view of what it looks like to be a listing agent in receiving offers from buyers with their agents. Okay. Now, let's take it back to market conditions. Depending on where we're at in the market, how the market is behaving right now, uh, is really how you're going to be structuring your offer, right? And this is where you have to be able to trust your buyer's agent so that they know how to navigate you through writing the best offer. But here's what I find as a listing agent. I'm going to give you the point of view of a listing agent. Can By just a show of hands, do you guys know if we are in a seller's market, a buyer's market, or a neutral market. Let me ask you guys this. How many of you think we're in a buyer's market? I'm going to ask virtually too. If you guys want to comment below, okay, do you think we're in a seller's market, in a buyer's market, or in a neutral market? Who believes we're in a buyer's market? Anybody? Buyer's market. Okay, no one? All right, I don't think anybody virtually said buyer's market. Good job. Does anybody believe we are in a seller's market? We're in a seller's market. Okay. Well, everybody who thinks we're in a seller's market, you are absolutely right. And I'm just going to give you the easiest way to tell which market we are in. Do you guys happen to know the probably the easiest, the most simplest form to tell whether what market we're in? Anybody? Yes. Inventory. Inventory. Okay. Yes. Supply and demand. Exactly. Supply and demand. So here's the like real the formula. If all of the active listings right now on the market could sell in less than six months, we are in a seller's market. If they all could sell between six and seven months, we're in a neutral market. And anything above seven months, we are in a we are in a buyer's market. Correct. So do you happen to know just micro? Let's do we're in Long Beach. Okay. Most neighborhoods in Southern California are moving pretty fast. Do you guys know how many months of supply we're at right now here in Long Beach? Very good. We are actually less than two months, which means we are literally in a really hot seller's market. Okay. So if we're in a hot seller's market, you can anticipate, I'm sure that you guys remember back in 2020, 2021, right? Even in the beginning of 2022, a property will go on the market and then how many offers it's getting? 10, 14, over asking. People are giving like their firstborn child, right? To get their offer accepted. So 
we're seeing, we, we're seeing that once again. So as a listing agent, there's a couple parameters that I'm looking at with our team when we are receiving offers. First part is when a property, when a seller is hiring us to sell their home, the property, hey, I don't know who said hi, but hello. Uh, the property goes on live on the MLS, right? Properties listed. Guess what happens? I have agents left and right calling me, texting me, right? Asking to show the property. This is where I'm paying attention as a listing agent to the communication they're giving me. How are they communicating? First of all, did they even read the instructions on the MLS that says you could not show the property until the first open house? And yet they're still texting me 40 times a day asking me if they can see the house. Happens all the time. Okay. That's communication, right? I'm looking into that. I'm also paying attention to what about when I have an open house, let's say right? And now the agents are coming in with their buyers. Maybe if they've, we've done business together before, maybe I know them, maybe I don't. But I'm also going to be paying attention to how they're communicating with me, how they are with their buyers, right? And then when they actually submit an offer, how is a buyer's agent communicating with me when they're sending their offer? You guys, would it be crazy to believe that I have received offers from agents that actually go into my spam and the agent absolutely never checked with me for receipt of offer. That could be your agent, right? That could be the agent that you're thinking you're, you're working with. They're representing you. So like Kathy mentioned, this is usually the time where buyers feel in the dark because they're trusting their representative, their agent to communicate with the listing agent that's representing the seller to put your best foot forward. But if you don't know, if you're working with your cousin, Joe, who just got his license, right? And is doing it as a side hustle, <laughs> right? That's cousin Joe is not checking with me that your offer is on spam. And now you lost on that house that you really loved. Happens all the time. So I'm paying attention as a listing agent to the communication the agents are giving me. But then guess what else I'm paying attention to? I'm paying attention to know how they've performed in our industry. So our team here, my transaction coordinator, Gardenia, she has a procedure that anytime we receive offers, she is to check the stats of every buyer's agent who's writing an offer. Why is that important? Hmm. Well, for a couple of, couple of reasons. One, we want to know how many escrows they have closed. Most importantly, we want to know how many escrows they have closed, whether it's locally or, you know, an hour and a half away or Inland Empire or somewhere else, but also when. If someone has closed four homes during the time that, you know, was 3% and the market was maybe a little bit easier, okay. I want to know agents that have done transactions and helped buyers navigate through an escrow through different kinds of markets, right? Because now that gives us the confidence to know this agent has gone through shifting markets, has gone through seller's market, buyer's market, maybe neutral markets. They're absolutely going to know how to navigate their buyers, right? Which makes it easier for us right? It's a nicer flow with our sellers. And I can give the seller confidence that we're working with somebody that knows what they're doing. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay. That's why it's so important, right? Whenever my sellers uh, ask me, they're like, you pulled stats on the buyer's agents? I'm like, oh, yes, I did. I'm presenting 10 offers to you. I don't care that the highest one is $60,000 over. This agent has only closed one house, has only helped one family close in Moreno Valley two years ago. Okay. It happens all the time, you guys, right? That's why it's so important that as a listing agent, we're checking stats. Okay. Again, who you work with matters, right? So who is your agent that's representing you find your first home? Then when we're in escrow, we go into escrow and now I want to know how the agent is communicating. By this time, I've already, we've already checked them out so much that we know that they have good communication. We know we've already seen their stats. We've already seen what they've done in the business, right? 
Sometimes we're actually checking their Google reviews. We're checking their reputation online as well. Um, most agents doing business here in our city of Long Beach, we kind of all know each other if we do business, right? So I can tell that someone walks into my open house and they're like, I got to buy your Gia. I've done business with them before and I trust that they're good agents. Um, but nine out of 10 times, you guys, as a listing agent, I am seeing, I am seeing that the bar is very, very low out there. Uh, for buyers agents. So that is really like as you're interviewing agents and as you're, you know, speaking to who's going to help you navigate through the process and represent you, make sure that you as a buyer are asking these questions. How many buyers have you helped in 2020? How many buyers have you, how long have you been in the business? How many escrows have you closed successfully in what types of markets? Does that make sense? That's really important to know. In this market, especially because it's so fast moving, you got to know that your agent is absolutely putting their best foot forward for you. During the search process, during the offer process, right? Which will give you the confidence to know that they're looking out for your best interest during the escrow process as well to negotiate best for you. Does that all make sense? Does that make sense on how it's so important to also know the listing agent's point of view, right? To know that it's not just like Kathy mentioned, your wants, your needs. There's also somebody else, another party in the equation that's going to be deciding if you're the right one to get into a monogamous relationship with, <laughs> right? So now that we have gone through understanding a budget, understanding the buying process, the dating process, right? Uh, I'm sure that you guys now have more of a clarity as to when is the right time for me to buy? Do I need to start preparing now? Maybe I've already done a lot of these steps that we discussed and you're probably ready yesterday, okay? So whether you were ready yesterday, whether you're ready in the next three months, in the next six months, it's really, really important that you have partners with you that are going to take care of you, that are going to look out for your best interest. And so we're going to leave it open at the end. By the way, at the end of your handout, you guys, we have some of our trusted partners as well. Uh, there's during all of our workshops, we're going to have more experts come in to give you, to empower you even more as you're looking for your first property. Perhaps you're going to be a homeowner and now you're looking for your next property. So we're going to open it up for any questions, including virtually for all of you who joined us. Uh, we do have one loan officer here, one of our trusted partners here, Sergio, and he does speak Spanish as well. So if you guys have any questions for Carrie, our financial advisor, Kathy, our buyer specialist, or myself, listing agent point of view, or Sergio, we're going to open up uh, Q&As and let us know how, if this was helpful, if this gave you clarity this is recorded. So this is also going to be on YouTube to show you guys to, again, like you, you literally can rewatch this over and over to understand the process and what's important as you're preparing to buy your first home. So thank you so much for coming out. It's Thursday. Thank you so much for jumping on whoever's with us virtually. It's Thursday. It's in the evening. Some people get off of work and, you know, and go home and watch TV or take care of the kids, but you guys have actually made the time, right? You're investing the time in yourself to really learn how to set yourself up for success and buy your first home. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being here. And let's open it up for Q&A. We got anything, Jonathan? Question. All right. What about you guys? Any questions? What questions do you have for us? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what the housing ratio is? The housing ratio, housing your ratio. front end ratio. Yes. So the front end ratio is what a lender is going to look at to determine what your total expense, how much of your income, your gross income is going towards your housing expenses, right? Your property and um, your property taxes, your principal and interest, your HOA fees. If, you've got a homeowner's association and your insurance. The maximum that you're allowed to spend of your gross income can range, but typically it's around 28%. It can go up to 31 for an FHA and uh, that will depend on which lender you choose. Okay, so the lenders determine yeah. that rate. 
So the lender is going to come in and it's going to be a, a mixture, right? It's going to depend on your income, uh, what your down payment is, what your debt ratio is, and what your credit scores are. That's all going to play a factor in determining how high you can go on that, that front end ratio. Sergio, and, and, and to piggyback on that, it's also like the loan program, right? The type of loan program. Correct. Okay. <laughs> come on up. Yeah. This is Sergio, you guys. <laughs> uh, so yes, it's depending on the loan program, um, which like Carrie mentioned, is if it's a conventional loan or an FHA loan. For example, the perks of FHA is you can have more debt. Okay? So the ratio goes up to 57%. Um, but as far as conventional, you know, the, the ratio yeah. of front end can be higher, but your overall debt has to be lower. Right. So it's just different programs, but it's a simple calculation. And um, a really good rule of thumb to know as far as how much you qualify for is uh, for every $20,000 of income that you're showing, most lenders will lend you $100,000. Okay. okay. So that's a really good uh, rule of thumb. And then as far as debt, uh, for every $100 of minimum debt that you have, your qualification will be reduced by $20,000. So quick little scenario as far as ratio, let's say, um, let's say that you make $100,000 a year. Uh, most lenders will lend you half a million dollars with a, with a very small down payment. And let's assume that you have no debt, but you have a car payment and your car payment is 500 bucks. So in that scenario, your, uh, your qualification before the debt would be 500,000. And then after including your debt into that ratio, it's 400,000, your qualification. Yes. Can I ask, do lenders care about student loans? Do lenders care about student loans? What a great question. Yes, we do. And even if they are deferred, we still count, count them. Uh, for example, if it's going to be an FHA loan, we only would look at half a percent of the total balance if it's in deferment. Uh, ideally, um, income-driven uh, repayment programs are ideal because usually your monthly payment is even lower than that. Um, okay. If it's a conventional loan, we look at 1% of the balance. Or if it's an income-driven uh, payment, then we look at the income-driven payment. So, so depending on the program, on the loan program yeah. is what you would be looking at in, uh, of a deferred student loan. Correct. Got it. Okay. That was, that was, oh, that was really good to know. So, and just to add to that, um, balance, I noticed that a lot of people have really high balances for their student loans, but the actual impact that it has on your qualification is very small. Hmm. If you really think about half of, not even 1%, half of 8% of the total amount. So sometimes, you know, someone owes 50,000, we're looking at like a $200 hit, but most people have a $500 car payment. So it's really the car payment set that hurt ah. more than student loans. You know, and that, that is great that you just said that and brought clarity because Kathy, I mean, can't imagine how many buyers out there, how many people who are actually thinking of purchasing will literally paralyze themselves, right? Because they think I have too many student loans. I can't afford a house right now without really understanding from a lender, right? How is that seen to qualify for a loan, right? How is that taken? So that, that, that's wonderful. Um, Kathy, come on up, Kathy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, didn't she do great with our buyers spend with a dating yes. buyers like date, yeah. right? Buying processes like dating. If anybody has questions for Kathy, Make sure that you guys can follow us on social media on the last page of, oh, yes. I have a question. For yes. The, for the sake of building wealth, if I intend on getting married within the next year, should I buy before that time or should I wait until then to increase my buying power? Ooh, so that's a good one. There's a lot of different things at play there. Yeah. Buying together could be helpful even before your marriage. But then you're also thinking of separate assets versus community property, at least in the state of California. So that's going to be a, just a personal question for you. If you're okay um, going in together prior to and then making it community property, that's going to be your best bet. Um, but it's, it's really, are you really going to make it down the aisle and marry this individual? Yeah. But also deciding, I mean, because I've had conversations with with uh, with people about this and it's just deciding whether you want to own a piece of property first. Right. Before as a single person and then maybe in the future, buy something else with with your new spouse. Yeah. Right? I mean, you can as definitely do that. Property. You likely won't qualify for as much mm -hmm. of a house. Um, and if you're OK and you're willing to compromise there, then you'll definitely build your own separate asset wealth there. And if I'm not mistaken, once we get married, I can we can no longer utilize separate FHA loans, right? I was going to jump into that part. Yes. Go ahead, Sergio. So I like to tell my clients, if it's possible, 
house rings and for wedding rings, right? <laughs> or for key rings oh. and for wedding rings. Um, I agree. So for, <laughs> so for FHA, uh, ideally buy before getting married because once you are married, even if, for example, you're not going to include your other spouse's income, you have to include their debt, right? Mm. So it's yes. automatic. And that actually hit, hits, affects your DTI. So ideally, if each, each person can buy separately, and then when they're married, we can look at conventional loans, with, which have different um, you know, rules and all that. But for FHA, it's usually ideal before marriage. And if you're able to do it, I mean, it's, it's a pretty smart move to do something like that. Now you're coming into your real monogamous relationship, <laughs> right? Yes. With an asset now, right? You have an asset and then maybe they've had one too. And now you're like sitting on equity, they're sitting on equity. And now maybe you put both of your equities together, your monies together and purchase something new. So I've, um, I've, we've helped so many people navigate through that process. And we've seen so many couples make a lot of smart moves even before getting married, but planning on getting married and they still decide to buy things separately first. So that's a great question. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. You mentioned that interest rates are around 7%. So what does that mean in relation to everything? Um, for your taxes, you mean? Yeah. Okay. So your mortgage interest deduction, mm -hmm. um, if you're say in the 30% tax rate and you're paying $10,000 towards interest, well, the government is covering $3,000 of that. So your true cost of ownership has now gone down by $3,000, right? So if your normal taxation is 10, and now all of a sudden you've got a deduction on your books that's saving you three, that can be reallocated over to your home payment and reduce that true cost. Yeah. Well, you guys, listen, we're here for you. Again, find us on social, on your handout. You have all of our social information uh, on the partners list as well. I would say that usually now, if people are like seriously thinking about purchasing a home and wanting to create a plan, create a budget, uh, the next step is absolutely get with your team, get with your trusted partners, right? With your buyer specialist, with your financial advisor, with your lender um, to know exactly what are the steps you need to take because whether you're planning on buying soon or later, planning is the number one. Planning, you're going to be so much ahead than most people who just assume things that they can and cannot do, but don't actually meet with, um, with their team, with their partners that can help them through that. So thank you guys so much again. And we're here for you. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.